How are you, Mr. President? I'm very good. Thank you, Shane. My second interview since you've been president. Uh, you guys want to start with good news? Yeah. We do have some good news. Go ahead. Right? You don't get a lot of good news in the media. Well, you don't get so much. The market's up 25% since you were won. You tweeted this out that nobody in the media brings it up, so I said, you know what, I'm going to bring it up tonight. $5.2 trillion in wealth created. We have the lowest unemployment rate in 16 years. We have the, lo the best labor participation rate in seven years and the best, the lowest number of people on food stamps in seven years. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. It's going really well. I'm loving it. I'm doing a job for the people, and uh, people are seeing that. And I'm so proud of the $5.2 trillion of increase in the stock market. Now, if you look at the stock market, that's one element, but then we have many other elements. The country, we took it over at owed $20 trillion. As you know, the last eight years, they borrowed more than it did in the whole history of our country. So they borrowed more than $10 trillion, right? And yet, we picked up $5.2 trillion just in the stock market possibly picked up the whole thing in terms of the first nine months, in terms of value. So you could say in one sense we're really uh, increasing values and maybe in a sense we're reducing debt. But we're very honored by it and we're very, very happy with what's happening on Wall Street. You came back to Pennsylvania. I know you've been in Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio and North Carolina because a lot of people still need opportunity and jobs. Right. You really hear you're going to be talking at length about your economic plan. That's right. Let's talk about it. Okay. Well, first of all, it's a massive tax cut. And, you know, it's a reform, but it's a massive tax cut. <laughs> Somehow that's And, you know, when we first introduced it, and for years they talk about tax reform, I said the problem with the word reform, nobody understands what it means because reform could mean you're going to raise taxes. This is the largest tax cut in the history of our country. It is incredible. It's going to put people to work. So right now, Sean, we are the highest taxed nation in the world, and we're going to be now down in the lower rung in terms of taxes. Uh, a family can get, and a business can get, especially a subchapter S. You know, you're doing different kinds of things with your businesses. Some people run it individually. But you can get as much as a 40% tax reduction. Again, it's the largest tax reduction in the history of Let's America. go through. So, and this is important. I mean, how many, t there's no two accountants that can give you the same liability to the government if you give them the same information. That's how complicated the tax code is. It's, it's you want to drop right. seven brackets to three. We're going to drop, actually, if you look at it, because we have a zero bracket, because a lot of people pay zero. So we really have four, and they had eight. So it's really eight down to four. We're cutting it in half. And a lot of, a lot are taxed below the $12,000 mark and $24,000 mark for a family. They're taxed at zero. After that, it goes to 12% from 15%. And you know, the Democrats told a very terrible fib. They said that they read the brackets so that the brackets were inverted. And if you read it that way, but that's not the way it goes. And we've been praised for the amount of money the middle class, this is really what I'm looking for. For the middle class, I call it the working people. And the working people are going to get a massive tax break. And corporations and companies and small companies are going to get large-scale tax relief. And they'll be able to keep compete with anybody in the world, which said, is what we need. You said the, the corporate rate, which is so important, you said 20% is your max. So right now, we're at 35 percent, and many corporations are paying 40s and 42, and because they have state taxes and city taxes, and they have taxes so many different directions, you know what they do? They leave the country, and they fire everybody, and they're gone, and they never come back. Now we have companies moving back into the country. We have, you saw last week, auto companies are announcing that they're going to build plants back in the United States. That hasn't happened for years. And they're moving back, like, and not just because of the tax. This tax is so important. But they're seeing enthusiasm. We have the highest enthusiasm level in 28 years Consumer for confidence. manufacturing, for all of the different things that we talk about. But for business, basically, it's enthusiasm. Everybody's enthused about our country. So we're very honored by it. And I am really honored by the folks in this room. And by the way, the truckers, we love the truckers. I can tell you. <laughs> sure. Happens to me, The top 10% pay 70% of the tax bill. The bottom 50% pay two yeah. of, of the total income tax rate. 
Why is the, the there are multinational corporations that have parked trillions of dollars in ta in countries that offer them better tax relief? Yeah. You're trying to incentivize those trillions to come back here with a low repatriation rate. How low will that be, and how much do you think you can bring back into the United States, and what does it mean? Okay, so right now you have probably, and nobody knows the exact number because it's, I, I actually think it's much higher than people understand, but it'll probably be over $3 trillion is outside of our country and our companies, and they just can't get it back. They're trying but they can't get it back. Number one, it's a bureaucratic mess. Number two, the tax rate is so high, it doesn't make sense. So what they do is they invest it in Europe and other places where the money is. And I'll tell you what they do also. They leave the country because the money becomes so much and so valuable to them that they leave the country, our country, to go and get their money. So they leave the country and they fire everybody. Now what we're doing is we're lowering the rate so they can bring it back in. We're giving them a shot to bring all that money. It's all gonna come back in. It's gonna come back in immediately. It's going to be more than $3 trillion. Probably we're looking at a 10% rate. It may be around that number, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, but it's going to be right around that number, probably 10%. And right now what it is is 35% plus. Now, who's going to bring money back when you have to pay, by the time you finish, almost half of your money in tax? So You're never going to bring it back. So we're going to have that money come back in. It's going to put people to work so fast, and the money itself is going to go to work very fast. And, you know, say what you want about Democrats and Republicans. For years, years and years, everybody's wanted to do that. You have trillions of dollars outside of our country, offshore, and the Democrats wanted it back, the Republicans wanted it back, everybody wanted it back, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't get a deal. We're going to do a deal, and we're putting it down as part of our tax cuts. Let me, uh, one of the things some people have brought up, like that... <laughs> Every time I turn, tune into anybody else in the media except Fox, the oh, tax cuts for the wealthy. Yeah. Now, the rate for some people go, goes down, but if you live in a state like New York or Illinois or New Jersey or California, you won't be able to deduct your local or state income tax. In other words, if you elect politicians that want to raise taxes, you're going to pay the penalty. So that's not really true that this is a tax cut for the wealthy as they're portraying it. What is your answer to that? Well, you know, you have some really well-run states that have very little borrowing. Some have no borrowing, but they have very little borrowing. And it's unfair that a state that is well-run is really subsidizing states that have been horribly mismanaged. I won't use names, but we understand the names. But there are some states that have hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in borrowing and it's unfair that those states really are being subsidized by states like Indiana and Iowa. And I mean, I could name many states. I could probably name three quarters of them. They're so well run and they're being penalized. They're being penalized and it's not fair. And so what we're doing is we're showing that. Now with all of that, the tax cuts are so steep that the people in every state benefit. But it's finally time to say, hey, make sure that your politicians do a good job of running your state. Otherwise, you're not going to benefit. You know, you look at a place like Florida, it's really well run no by Rick tax. Scott. And, you know, by Governor Scott, he's done a great job. And so many people have done a great job. And those are the people that, frankly, should, the, the people that had the intelligence to elect them should really benefit. And that's what we're doing. We're creating an incentive. And the, do, the bottom line, though, look, the tax cut is massive. We're bringing it down to 20 percent. We're bringing it down to uh, 12 percent for individuals. Uh, we're bringing it down to zero in some cases. If it's a family, it's below $24,000. Anything below $24,000 is zero. And look, it, it's as I just said, it's the biggest tax cut in the history of our country, and it's going to spur growth, and it's going to keep our companies here. Our companies are leaving because the taxes are so high. But you also, a big part of it you've already done, and that is you've ended a lot of the Obama-era Obama regulations, especially in, in industries like energy and coal. Right. There seems to be, you have a very strong commitment. You just recently went forward with ANWR. You've put in place opportunities for the coal mining industry, right. fracking. We do have an opportunity to be energy independent, and there seems to be millions of high-paying career jobs for people available if that decision is made. How big a part is that for the economic recovery? Well, I have done so much, and Scott Pruitt, who is in EPA, 
has done incredibly. You saw yesterday at a news conference on coal, and his whole concept was coal is back. It's back. And the miners are working again. They're fracking in Pennsylvania. This isn't a bad area either. Well, as an example, mines are opening in the state of Pennsylvania. And I love this state because I happen to go to college in this state. I know it very well. And you I love also it. won this. You also won Pennsylvania, right? Is he going to win Pennsylvania in 2022? Yeah. No, it's, by the way, incredible people, incredible state. And I did win Pennsylvania. I worked hard in Pennsylvania. And frankly, I understand what Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is about work. These are working, these are people that want to work. But we're opening mines. We're opening mines in the state of Pennsylvania. We're opening mines in other places. You know, coal is a very, and I call it clean coal. They have technology today that's so incredible. What they can do with a piece of coal is so incredible. I call it clean coal, but it's one of our great resources. One thing that I'm very proud of, the state of West Virginia, last month, it was one of the highest increases, percentage increases in GDP. The state of Texas beat it. And people are saying, wait a minute, West Virginia just came in second. You know what that's about? That's about cutting regulations and letting the people go and mine. Mm. And I was so proud of that because West Virginia's had very tough times. And you know, they were overwhelmingly for me. Yeah. Hillary said she wants to close up industries, and she wants to close up the coal industry, and I'm the opposite. So I'm very proud of that, and Pennsylvania likewise. Very proud. The, the biggest obstacle before you arrived here, I had an opportunity to interview a lot of people in this great crowd, and I asked them basically three different questions. What they thought of you, overwhelmingly, the, oh, there's a lot of support for you here. Congress. When I asked them about, what was your answer on Congress? What was your answer on the media? It's, it's, we saw what happened with health care and John McCain. This economic plan sounds a lot to me like what Reagan did, and that created 20 million new jobs and revenues doubled. This is important for your agenda. Yeah. How do you get this through the Senate? which has not had a good record in the last 10 months. Well, first of all, this will be an even bigger tax cut than the great Reagan cuts. This will be even more dramatic, and I think it will create even more incentive. But let's talk, media is bad. They're really dishonest people. These are very, very dishonest people, in many cases, in many cases, and not all. Look, I know some reporters, I know some journalists that are phenomenal people and very straight, very honest, but there's such dishonesty I mean, you know, it's interesting. If I was just watching television, you don't know whether or not, because, you know, you're just watching a report. But when you're the one being written about, you know if it's good or bad, and it's always, they try and make it negative. So the media has turned out, I call it fake media. It's fake. fake it's news. so much fake news. And we you have to understand. You agree with that, fake news? You know, and I only say it so when, when people read things, they can understand that so much of it is indeed fake. But with Congress. I've gotten to know a lot of them. There are a lot of good people. Don't forget, for health care, we had 48 votes, 49 votes. We had a lot of great Republicans. We need more Republican senators, to be honest with you. But we had a lot of great. And you have a good one. You have a good one running. Lou. By the way, Lou Barletta, as long as we're on the subject, Lou Barletta, great guy. He's running. He was an incredible congressman. And, and I think, I think you're going to have a tremendous surge for Lou Barletta. I think he's going to do a fantastic job. Uh, so that's it. And we do need more Republican senators because we have a tiny, smaller. We have 52 to 48. And if a couple of people want to grandstand or whatever they want to do, all of a sudden, because when you have to get almost every single vote, you need 51. So you have to get at least 50 because the vice president, Mike Pence, great guy, right? Great. He, he comes out. So he votes. So we need 50. So that means out of all of these people, two people decide they want to do something for whatever reason. And some cases it is. It's grandstanding. Now all of a sudden you don't have health care. 
But we're going to get it anyway. We have it. We have the numbers now. We're going to get that. And tomorrow, I'm signing something that's going to be incredible that I can do this myself. This is in 1974. There was. Go this ahead. has to do with we're going to have great health care across state lines. People can buy it. Will cost the government nothing. You'll go out. Private insurers are going to give you incredible health care. And I'll tell you what, uh, this will take, and I can sign it myself. I don't need anybody. I would have done it earlier, except I was hoping that they were going to put this through and I'd have it in the bill. But right. we're signing tomorrow a health care package that will cover, I don't know, people say 30 percent, people say 25 percent, and some people say it could be 50 percent. It's going to cover a large percentage of the people that we're talking about. Truck, truckers would benefit truckers, if they truckers unite. Truckers are perfect for this. Right. They unite. They form right. a group. See? Right. No, truckers will, will benefit. They'll form a group. But this will be fantastic. Now, I would have done this immediately, but we were hoping for the health care. So I think health care is going to pass. I, I can't imagine the largest tax cut for people in our history not passing. But I have to say this. I've met some great, great people that are Republicans, and I've met some great people. Frankly, I've met some good people, not necessarily great people, that are Democrats. <laughs> and I actually think we'll have Democratic support from a few people. You do? I do. I do believe that we'll have some Democrat support. We'll get a few votes, maybe. Uh, you know, it's interesting. The one thing with the Democrats, they stay together like glue. They're lousy politicians, and their policies are terrible, but they do stick together. Mm -hmm. We have great policies, mm -hmm. but the Republicans tend not to be as unified. So with some people, you saw and heard Bob Corker. Yeah. John McCain wasn't there, even though I can run a, I can run a hundred ads showing John McCain, I'm going to repeal and replace yeah. Obamacare. He, vote, he wouldn't even vote to just repeal it. Yeah, I know. So that's got to be frustrating and disappointing. Well, we thought we had it the first time. We thought it was done. Mm -hmm. And we thought John was with us. And all of a sudden, I don't know where he voted again. So we end up losing by one vote. But here's the thing. We're going to get it. And, you know, I always say never give up, never, ever quit. We don't quit. We're there. We're one vote short. We're, we're, we're there. I actually think right now we have the vote. But we have to wait. We have to wait for a little while. We're going to do the taxes first. Hopefully, we get that. We need 51 votes. You and think you can get it done by it. the end of the year? I hope so. I mean, who's going to vote against this? Our country is losing businesses, losing jobs. We have a 1% GDP. Now, I have to tell you, for the last quarter, three, you had 3%. 3-2. Three and actually, 3-2, they adjusted it upward. What a nice sound that is. Are they playing that for you or for me? They're playing that in honor of his ratings. Did you see how good his ratings are? He's beating everybody. I think they'll be higher tonight. I'm just guessing. Uh, so the fact is that uh, we really, we're really rocking. Uh, we have 3.2. Now, this next quarter coming up, I believe, would have even been better. You know, we haven't hit threes in a long time. So I guess it was ultimately determined it was 3.2 because they adjust upward. But we got hit with a few hurricanes, as you probably heard. That'll have, I assume, an impact. Barack Obama was the first president in history that never hit 3% GDP growth in a single year of his presidency, which I think speaks volumes. Um, well, you know, I'll, when I took over, yeah. we were in the ones. And if we hit, think of this, if we hit just one point, if we go up from two to three, we pick up $2.5 trillion, $2.5 trillion. To the Treasury. And we pick up millions of jobs. Yeah. So it pays for the whole thing. So it really pays for it. So I think it'll be good. A lot of people, I was surprised watching all last year with Colin Kaepernick. Guy praised a murdering thug dictator. He had socks that depicted yeah. cops as pigs. Yeah. And, and other issues, he actually donated to a charity that actually supported a cop killer. And then we saw the NFL. And you took it on, it appears, based on the letter that Roger Goodell put out yesterday, that Donald Trump initiated a debate over standing for the flag and our anthem and those that fought, blood, and died, and looks like you won. So I watched Colin Kaepernick, and I thought it was terrible. And then it got bigger and bigger and started mushrooming. And frankly, the NFL should have suspended him for one game, and he would have never done it again. They could have then suspended him for two games, and they could have suspended him if he did it a third time for the season, and you would never have had a problem. 
But I will tell you, you cannot disrespect our country, our flag, our anthem. You cannot do that. Obviously, the people of the country are with you. Hundreds of thousands of people fought, bled. Hundreds of thousands died fighting under that flag. Right. Um, when you look at the Obama years, Chicago, one city, his adopted hometown, 3,900 people were murdered. Yeah. In the last six years of Obama's presidency, 18,000 shootings. I don't think he it's mentioned it, but three or four times. Yeah, it's hard to believe. And disproportionately, his economic policies hurt black Americans, Hispanic Americans right. more. That's very sad. How will your policies help minorities that are still struggling? Well, first of all, minorities want police protection more than anybody. They need it more than anybody. It's what's going on is crazy. And you look at some of these inner cities where it's just out of control. And remember, I was saying things like, we will, you know, what do you have to lose? We will fix it. We're going to fix it. But one of the things we're doing very strongly now is the inner cities. Now, Chicago is out of control. I don't know what they're doing in Chicago to have this many shootings and this many killings and all of the different things that are going on. This is not like it's the United States of America. And pure and simple, that's bad management. That's bad politics. It's incredible. And then... You talk to them, why aren't you doing something? They don't even want to talk to you about it. It's, it's really insulting to our nation. And whether you take on the NFL or you take on Chicago and some of our other cities, there shouldn't be murders like this. And you know, we have incredible police in this country. They could stop it if they were allowed to do their job. They could stop it. Thank you. Well, Sean. In many cases, it's the police are not allowed to do their job. They have to be politically correct. We're talking about lives of wonderful people. And they have to be allowed to do their job. And you will see it stop. I'll never forget, I was in Chicago. And a police officer, there was a motorcycle deal to the plane. And I was talking to the police. I was taking a picture. I said, how do you stop this? We could stop it immediately, sir. I said, what do you mean you could stop it immediately? If they'd let us do our job, we could stop it immediately. Now, at some point, you're going to have to let them do their job. And they want to do their job. That's the incredible thing. We did it on the border. The border was like a sieve. Now it's down 78 <laughs> percent. And that's without the wall. Wait until you see what happens when we build the wall. But, but General Kelly has done an incredible job. These are people, they know how to do it, but they have to be allowed to do it. You look at the difference in the border. You saw though. Rudy incredible. Giuliani in right. New York. Rudy did a fantastic job in New York, and Ru that's an example. And Rudy was on our campaign, and when Rudy endorsed me, to me, that was a very important endorsement, because he did a great job, especially with respect, well, you could also say economic development, but especially with respect to crime in New York City. We watched a lot of high-profile incidents during the Obama years, uh, Ferguson. Trayvon Martin down in Florida, Freddie Gray, he called the, as he said, the Cambridge Police Act that stupidly, it seems every two or four years, and I've been now th 30 years in radio, I just started my 23rd year at Fox, that every two or four years, thank you, uh, Good job. every two to four years, the Democrats will play the race card, and I resent it as a conservative. Because they'll say, oh, their policies, they're racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. And meanwhile, their policies haven't helped the minority communities in America. Is there a way, from the federal government's perspective, that you can bring economic yes, opportunity? Totally. I mean, look. And safety. And that's what we have said. You look at what's happened in our inner cities. There, it's a, it's horrible what's going on in terms of the death in terms of shooting. A, a woman gets up and she wants to go on walking with her beautiful daughter, get a loaf of bread, and she ends up getting shot, or the daughter gets shot, and we can stop it. Don't forget, the Democrats have ruled the inner cities for 100 years. This is their rule. Very rarely do you have a Republican there, but this is their rule. That can be turned around. We can do so many things, but the Democrats have truly ruled. And, and when I was running, I would always say, what do you have to lose? I remember this, this I remember came that. up out of nowhere. I'm reading the statistics of a certain inner city, which were terrible. Uh, education is terrible. Crime rate is terrible. Every single element, economic development, jobs, are, everybody was unemployed. And I said, just, I'm reading, I'm saying, and I look at the audience, I say, what the hell do you have to lose? The place went crazy. And then I'd actually use it again and again, and we went up. And we're doing a good job. Ben Carson's doing a great job at HUD. He's got great heart. He's got great heart. So, but, 
the Democrats rule the inner cities, and when I say, what do you have to lose, it's so bad that really the Republicans should be starting to do very well. But we're doing a good job, and we're stopping a lot of the crime. Take a look. There was a lot of coverage of your phrase, they would report it in the media, cryptic phrase, the calm before the storm. It seemed related to Rocket Man, his term. Uh, Kim Jong-un. In terms of him having ICBM capability, nuclear capability, firing missiles over Japan, our ally, threatening Guam, and potentially maybe being able to reach the United States, continental United States, with a nuclear weapon. At some point, this is going to come to a head. What we was the calm before the storm? We can't let this to go on. We just can't. Now, you can say what you want. This should have been handled 25 years ago. It should have been handled 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago. It should have been handled by numerous, not just Obama, but certainly President Obama should have taken care of it. Now it's at a point where it's very, very far advanced. Something has to be done. We can't allow this to happen. Now, China's been very helpful, I think. I think. I, you know, who knows? They seem to be very helpful. Uh, they cut off banking to North Korea. That's something they've never done before. Uh, they've cut down, way down on the fuel, and a lot of other things. Uh, we're going to see what happens. But we cannot allow this to happen. This should have been taken care of long ago. Uh, Clinton gave them billions of dollars, gave them lots of other things, and before the contract, the ink was dry on the contract, they were already starting again with the missiles and with the nuclear, frankly. So we are in a position, look, we're very strong. I really, I'm building up the military like nobody's ever seen. We're close to $800 billion in spending. The the word, I don't know if you know, but the military, our military was totally, you know, really depleted. Uh, you look around and you see what's going on. You take a look at what we're buying right now with the jet fighters and all of the equipment we're buying. And, you know, it's two things, really. It is jobs, and that's far less important. Mm. But we build the greatest military equipment in the world. We have missiles that can knock out a missile in the air 97% of the time. And if you send two of them, it's going to get knocked out. Is it fair to say if he keeps firing missiles, that's going to end? Well, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to say anything. I'm just telling you, I don't want to talk about it. Because, you know, all these people, they talk. I remember when you said... I remember with Mosul. Yeah. And, you know, I use this all the time, with Mosul. Mm. Uh, we are going to be attacking Mosul in four months. We're attacking Mosul in three months. Until I say, why do they keep saying it? Attack, do it, or don't do it, or whatever. But they kept talking about it. And by the way, it turned out to be hell on wheels. It was hard, because they were so totally prepared. And I'm not saying I'm doing anything, and I'm not saying I'm not. But we shouldn't be talking about it. Calm before the storm, you're not going to talk about that no, either? No, I don't talk about it. No. Iran, it was interesting. It was interesting. Bill Clinton, when he made the deal with Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-un, he, he actually said, this is a good deal for the American people. It was not. It seems the same mistake was made with President Obama and the Iranian deal. There's reports you will decertify this. You can also pull out of it. John Bolton's suggesting you just pull out completely. Why decertify and not just scrap it? Well, you can do both, to be honest or do with both. you. You can do both. You can you decertify and then... I know exactly what I'm going to do, but I can't give it away tonight. But I'm going to be announcing it very shortly. But Why not, I, right? <laughs> but I will. I mean, there's no secret. I think it was one of the most incompetently drawn deals I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. $150 billion given. We got nothing. We got nothing. They got a path to nuclear weapons very quickly. And think of this one. $1.7 Billion dollars in cash. This is cash out of your pocket. What? You know how many airplane loads that must be? Did you ever see a million dollars like a promotion where they have a million dollars and hundred dollar bills? It's a lot of. This is 1.7 billion dollars. You'd almost say who would be authorized to do it, and who are the people that deliver it? You may never see them again, right? Yeah. But, plane loads. But just plane loads. So. This is the worst deal. We got nothing. We got nothing. So I'm not giving anything away, but I've been saying this for a long time. You have people dancing and screaming in the streets of Iran. Now, I have to tell you, 
those people are possibly staged because I happen to believe the people of Iran are great people and they want freedom and they want to be sort of friendly with us. I really believe that. But they're dancing in the streets and they're, they're singing death to America and carries out there negotiating a deal and giving up every single point. He'd go in, we'd like this, you're not having it. Done, done, done. It's the worst deal I've ever seen. Whether it's countrywide or any other wide, there is no worst deal. So we will see what happens pretty soon. A lot of people are guessing, mm -hmm. but maybe there's not so much guessing. But it was an incompetently you want drawn out of deal. This deal. Look, it was it's yeah. a very bad deal. I, I'm not saying anything different tonight than I have been saying for two years. Yeah. It's a horrible horrible embarrassment to our country let and we did you, it out of weakness when actually we had great strength let me ask you about immigration you came up with a, a 70 point plan there was fear after you had met with pelosi and schumer and you were talking about daca one of the things i've always noticed is you, we always get the tax increase we never get the spending cuts you yeah. always get the consideration on immigration you never get the wall built part of it is there will be you said no deal on DACA, unless, of course, we, it's good. we're going to end chain migration. You're going to build a wall that's going to be see-through now, so the... Well, it may be. We're, we're looking. Yeah. We right now have built five prototypes. They right. just are going up, and some of them are already finished. And I will say, they're really looking good. They're really looking good. And our country needs it. We need it not only for people, but we need it for the drugs that are pouring into our country. I mean, we have drugs that are pouring into our country, so we don't have a choice. And, you yeah, know, you can built. say what you want. Yeah. I was with Bibi Netanyahu of Israel, and he was saying, Donald, the wall works, believe me. They had an open border that was like a sieve. People just poured in. He said 99.9% .9 of the people now, it stopped. Nobody gets in. Could Nobody say, gets in. The, walls, uh, the wall, wall has by the way, to be built. It has to be built. A properly yeah. built, constructed, designed wall. High. Not a little fence like they'd have. They'd have they had walls that were so low, trucks would drive over them. <laughs> it was easier to drive over it than to take it down. Can you believe it? Okay. So no so, amnesty. No, no, the wall. No amnesty. No, no amnesty. No chain migration. A chain migration is one of the disasters. You allow yeah. one person in, yeah. and that one person brings in 10 or 12 people. No DACA until that you fund the wall. DACA, uh, look, we have 800,000 people. They're not necessarily young. You know, a lot of people think they're children. I guess they average from 16 to 39 or so. But a lot of these people are in the military. They have jobs. They have this, that. It's a very, I fully understand it. But if we're going to do something, we have to get something in return. And what I want is tremendous border regulation. I want the wall, and we're going to get other things. And we're going to see if we can work something out. Now, whether or not we do, I don't know. But it would be wonderful to solve the DACA problem. And by the way, even my most conservative, hardline friends in the Republican Party would, lie, would really like to be able to solve 800,000 people. And honestly, these people went through a lot because most of them went through our system. Many of them don't speak the language of their country because they've never been to their country. So we are going to try and solve that. But if we're going to solve that, we want a wall and we want great border security. I have identified, I, I, and I've even talked to this audience, I've never seen any one person face as much in terms of attacks as you have. You have a media that's hostile. You have Democrats that are hostile. You have Republicans that are hostile. A lot of deep state that has been leaking on you. And one of the things that has come up almost throughout your whole presidency is this Russia, 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 Russia obsession. Here's my question. I interviewed Julian Assange five times. I've talked to him other times. He has said it's not Russia. There was no collusion. They didn't come. The DNC emails did not come from them. Congressman Dana Rohrabacher met with him. And he says he has proof positive evidence that would show the Trump campaign never colluded with Russia. He just wants, is it in the best interest of the country that if he has that information that he should give it, it seems, I'm guessing here, he wants in return to be left alone. Should the country, okay. deserve, does the country deserve to know the truth if he yes, has that? Uh, the country has to know the truth. And also we can't let anybody play around with our voters and our voter system. But I have to tell you this. So important. But 
Russia was an excuse used by the Democrats when they lost the election. They said they lost the election. They sat in a room and they said, wow, we look bad. The morning after, in fact, it's been written about, I guess, mm -hmm. in various books or a book. But they said, why did you lose the election? They said, ah, it was Russia, Russia. It wasn't Russia, it was a bad candidate. It was a candidate that didn't go to Wisconsin and Michigan, like they should have. It was. It was a candidate that spent tremendously more money than I did, as you know, more than double, and didn't do well in Pennsylvania, this great state, didn't do well in Florida, didn't do well in North Carolina or South Carolina. I mean, lost Wisconsin for the first time in decades, lost Michigan. Now, with all of that being said, bad candidate, but they said Russia. Then they say, ah, and it was Trump that colluded with Russia. I'm saying, I did? <laughs> so look, here, here's the story, and I think it's so important. This was an excuse by the Democrats, and people got carried away. This was a terrible, and it's very bad for our country what's happened, because I don't deal with Russia I, during this campaign. Forget it. Forget it. This was an excuse that was used by the Democrats. It was an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, they should have won, because winning the Electoral College is so easy for a Democrat. You have to they start off with three major states. And to win the Electoral College for a Democrat, it's almost like a given. That's why people said, you cannot get to 270. Well, we got to 306, OK? Because we won a lot of the states. We won a lot of it. But, but I thought it was very sad when I saw this, because they're using excuses. And you know, one other thing I have to say. The Electoral College, I never appreciated. I always, I would rather have a popular vote. For me, it's easier because you go to different states. For me, the popular vote is easier. But the one thing about the Electoral College, it takes you around to states that you would not go to otherwise. So it's been a great thing. But I, I say this, we had an unbelievable, unprecedented election. Uh, it was, I'm so proud of my people. I'm so proud of you. You know, I did this show when a lot of a people lot. said, well, I did it a lot. Yeah. A lot of people, I guess, people are watching. It's only the second one that, that, since you've been president, but I'm glad to have you. No, but a lot of people, that's right. Maybe we won't do it anymore with him, right? Well, hey. Well, come on, help me out we here. We don't need it so much. Yeah, right. but, but I will say this. I will say this. You have been so great, and I'm very proud of you. And, you know, I'm a ratings person. You notice I always thought, OK. Has anyone seen his rating? What you are doing to your competition is incredible. Thank Number you. one, and I'm very proud of you. And it's an honor to be we in your show. I have to tell you that, Joe. Mr. President, I think, I remember one time we had an early, early conversation, and I'm going to end the interview on this. And this is how I've always felt. I just, I, you said, well, you know, I have all these things, and maybe you want to play golf on my course one day. You said this before, long before, we were friends before you ever ran for office. Right. And then when you ran, I just said, I only want one thing help our country, sure. let's help the forgotten men and women, let's keep this country safe. Sure. And I think that's our prayer for you and the country. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. The President of the United States.